Hey everyone, Sam Ovens here, and in today's video, I want to explain and show you what perfection looks like. And perfection is something that can really help you in a big way in business. And it's something that, you know, not a lot of people talk about because, one, a lot of people think, you know, chasing perfection is stupid and that no one is perfect and nothing can be perfect, right? So there's, there's that. But also, these days when I look outside and I see what most people are really shouting at you about and trying to convince you to believe in is just a whole lot of marketing crap. So like, you know, forget about what it is, just, for, just try and focus on what you can make people believe that it is, but really it isn't, right? And the truth is, is that in business, marketing and sales is not the main thing. In business, solving a problem and delivering value to your customer is the main thing. And the more value you provide, then the more successful your business will be. And how you provide value is by identifying an actual real life problem that exists among participants within a given market. We call this your niche. And then we identify this widespread problem. We understand it. And then we seek to solve it with a solution, which is our product or our service or what we're offering to people, right? Now, the bigger the problem, the bigger the business. You know, the bigger the problem you solve, the more money you will make, the more customers you will have. And so if you want to grow a big business and make a lot of money, you should really aim to find a really big problem that's extremely painful that a whole lot of people have, right? And then you should aim to provide the best possible solution to that problem. Because this is basically, you know, the formula. We start by finding a market. We'll just call this your niche. Right? And how you should pick your niche is basically something that you're interested in. So, you know, just think about what am I interested in and then what's related to that. So if I like golf, then I might want to look at different businesses and industries that all kind of uh, are related to golf. It doesn't have to be just playing golf and becoming a golf player. You know, there's lots of ways that you can really be involved in golf and also make a business out of it. So let's say I identify that a passion of mine is golf. And then I want to start looking for different industries, niches, and things that are related to golf. Then what I want to do is I want to understand what problems people face in this niche. Right? So let's say I want to focus in on uh, golf coaches and golf tutors. Now, I want to speak to them and identify what their most painful problem is. Something they wake up in the middle of the night, you know, really sweating and worrying about. And... It has, how we find out this problem is we actually go and talk to the people in the niche. You can't come up with the problem because you're not them and it isn't your problem. So don't try and do this by just racking your brain and, you know, trying to come up with it and trying to invent it in the shower. You won't do it. You have to get outside of you and you have to go talk to the market. And from here, you know, we identify problem. Now what we've done is we've found a niche and we've got a problem. But now what we need to do is we need to find a solution. And, you know, you'll probably be thinking, well, what's a solution? Well, it's simply the inverse of the problem. So the opposite of the problem would be the solution. So let's say if I'm a golf tutor and my problem is that I don't have enough clients, well, what's the solution going to be? It's going to be that I'm a golf tutor and I have enough clients. It's just the inverse of the problem, right? So it's this is very simple to think about. It makes business really, really, really simple. Just find a niche. How do you find your niche? Something you're interested in. Then look at the different industries, pick something, talk to the people, ask them what their problem is. They tell you what their problem is. Now, it's not enough if just one person tells you what their problem is. You need multiple people to tell you what their problem is 
and then you need to identify a pattern among the participants within this niche because we don't just want to solve one thing for one person we want to find something that exists among most people within this given market then we've got the problem we want to really understand this and then the inverse of that it would be the solution now you're probably thinking well how do we actually provide the solution to the niche to solve the problem right well what you do this is one of the easiest ways to do it is think about this is there anybody who is a golf tutor who has enough clients the answer will probably be yes pretty much with every one of these because people do solve their own problems and you know the thing is is a lot of entrepreneurship is really finding like a problem that a lot of people have and then identifying the rare few individuals that have solved that problem for themselves grabbing that solution and making it widely adopted by the masses and there's a saying that I like quite a lot, and it's, it's very true. And it, it goes like this. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. All right? So what you're really trying to do is find the people who had this problem and solved it, and they have it. And then you want to really study them and analyze them and see what they're doing. And then look at these people who have the problem and study them and analyze them and see what they're doing and then identify the core differences between this group and this group the people with the solution the people with the problem what is different about these two and then when you've identified the differences the differences is what you will be providing with your solution so you'll be providing these differences whether it's like tools whether it's tactics or strategies whether it's the level of skill needed or whether it's some kind of characteristic or behavior or different kind of patterns of action, right? There will be a combination of variables that makes this solution come true and you want to identify what those are, make it as simple as possible and you can put it in a service form, you can put it in a product form or a training form, whatever form the solution is best like suited to, put it into that. And then what you can do is you can sell the solution to participants of the niche with the problem. And when you apply a solution to a problem, the byproduct of this is value. And this is just how it works. You know, you can just boil business down to its first principles and really look at it, look at it like this. Find a niche you're interested in. Talk to the market, see what problems they have. Then, what's the inverse of the problem? That would be what the solution would look like. Go and find people who have the solution, see what they're doing. Look at the people who have the problem, see what they're doing. Analyze these two distinct groups and see what the differences are. Those differences, you should package into a solution. And when you provide a solution to a problem, when you apply a solution to a problem, the byproduct of this is value, and value is what people are willing to, and actually every day, pay money for. And so when you provide value, you make money, right? And the collection of all of this, right, is what we call a business. That is a business. A business is basically niche, problem, solution, value, money, and doing all of this in, you know, day to day and at larger and larger and larger scales and with more efficiency and basically just optimizing this. That is all business is. And the truth is, is the person who can identify the biggest problem and provide the best solution always wins. You know, you don't need to market yourself so much. You don't need to, like, be all over social media. And you don't need to be, like, you know, you don't need to be filming a daily vlog of your life and, like, you petting your dogs and, like, eating ice cream and driving around and, like, playing with your kids on TV and, uh, sorry, not TV, but on YouTube. You don't need to do this shit. I mean, if you want to do that, you can. And you're most welcome to. But you just need to understand that 
if you want to win in business, you just need to do this. That is it. And when you do this, the rest of the stuff really just takes care of itself. And so I wanted to start this video off today by just addressing this, because I wish I'd understood, I wish somebody told me this when I got started. It would have made my life a lot easier. But now, with that being said, let's talk about perfection. Because this is what this video is really about. And what's what happened over the weekend is the weekend just been, I held my mastermind event. It's called Quantum Mastermind. And it went for three full days. We go Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like 10 a.m. till like 7 p.m. pretty much. It's, it's intense. And this is a really smart group of people in here. We've got a lot of people making seven figures and about four people making eight figures. And it's a really smart group of people. And... In, in this mastermind, you know, all of these people, they've got clients, they're making money, some of them making a lot of money, and they've got a lot of clients, right? So if we've covered these first principle sorts of things, like finding a niche, finding a problem, solving the problem, providing value, and we're doing that successfully, then what's next? Like, how do we make it better? Because this is really where a lot of people get stuck. You know, a lot of people just... They, they, rem they have this right in the beginning because you really need this equation right to get something going. It's pretty hard for something to get going and for value to be provided and people to continue to pay you money without having that kind of equation right. But how do we make it better? And the way to do that is to really think about perfection. And what I mean by this is you want to think what would perfection look like? for my business. And I actually learned this from Google, from reading their letters to shareholders. And if you haven't read Google's letters to shareholders, I highly recommend it. It's, it's an awesome read. And also Amazon's letters to shareholders, they're an awesome read as well. And what I'll do is I'll link both beneath this video in the resources section. Uh, if you haven't checked them out yet, you can just click there, grab the one page, sorry, grab the single file PDF and I've compiled all of the years into one for you to make life easier for you. So highly recommend you go check those out. But when I was reading through the letters to shareholders, Google did something very smart. And they basically thought, what would perfection look like for Google, right? Because they need to know where they're going. They need some kind of, they need some kind of target to aim for and they need some kind of measuring unit and measuring instrument to really measure progress towards that goal, right? And what I've noticed with businesses is a lot of the time their targets and their goals and everything, they're very vague. They're undefined entities. And when you have an undefined entity, especially something that's vague and has been basically derived through multiple layers of abstraction, we really don't even know what the hell it is. And there's certainly no way we can measure it because there's no unit of measurement and there's no measurement instrument, measuring instrument to really see what's going on. So if you wanna know, if you wanna make steady progress and grow an awesome business, it's so important that you get this stuff very clear. And Google's mission statement is to organize all of the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, right? And so that mission statement really tells us a lot already. And so I'll write this here for you. So mission, organize all of the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And why this is really important to do, and you want to define a mission statement for your company, is because it really helps you understand what you're actually trying to do. And so this statement, you might think, oh, but this is just a bunch of words. It, it's more than that, because what we can do is we can see the areas that we need to focus on and improve in order to achieve this goal. 
So, I'll show you the key words in a good mission statement. So first of all, we've got information, organize, and universally accessible and useful, right? So these are the key statements, these are the key words in this statement. And what we can do from here is we're like, okay, well, what should we be doing day to day in our company? Well, first of all, we need to organize all of the world's information. So then we get information and we start to break information out. And when we break information out, you know, we might find, so I'll write here info, there's basically web pages, there's images, there's uh, books, there's videos, there's geo, which is like maps and Google Earth, and then uh, what else has Google organized? I mean, they've even gone into email, they've gone into flights, right? And so basically, the first category they're looking at is, well, we've got to organize all of the world's information, so let's break information out. We've got all of these different things, right? Now, by doing this, they're able to to know, like, the more web pages we index in our search engine, then the more progress we're making towards this goal. The more images we index and categorize, the more books that we scan into Google Books, the more actual titles that we've got scanned and searchable and indexed in our uh, database, then videos. So Google actually acquired YouTube early on for a billion dollars back when everyone thought YouTube was a stupid idea because and videos are a form of information and Google wants to organize all of the world's information. And more than that, Geo. They actually acquired Google Maps and Google Earth. They bought them just like they bought YouTube. And that is because they wanted to organize geographical data. And that is why they drive cars all around the world, forming those different street views. They've got satellites orbiting Earth, basically trying to... Uh, to image more of the world in higher and higher uh, definition and from more angles and with more frequent refresh times, right? They're trying, they're constantly making advancements along this axis. And then email, you know, they've basically taken over all of that and flights and there's a lot more. So what you can do just by saying, from this mission statement, we can see, well, we're trying to organize all of the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So let's look at the next piece in here, which is universally accessible. Well, let's call this like access. So to make information, once we've got this information indexed, then, you know, how are we going to, so indexing it and categorizing it, that's like organizing it, right? So we need to crawl all of this information, we need to index it, we need to categorize it, and we need to make sure we've got it stored in a database. That's the organize. The information is we need to get all of this different information, and we need to have more things indexed and more things categorized than anyone else in the world, which is true. They do that with all of these things. Then access. Okay, well, how are you going to make something universally accessible? Well, one of the first things would be languages. So, let's put languages. Because the more languages you provide this information in, the more people on Earth can actually access it. But it goes more than that. You know, there's also mobile devices, because a lot of the world doesn't actually have uh, a laptop or a desktop computer. So we've got mobile. And then we also have like voice, which is you can search Google with voice now. And so here you can see that we've got different languages and mobile and voice. So when it comes to languages, it's quite fascinating when you read Google's letters to shareholders. You'll see that Larry Page and Sergey Brin, they say in the letters each year, we're making good progress with our goal. We have indexed like this many more billions of web pages or whatever, right? And we've also indexed this, ma this many more images. We also decided that we needed to start categorizing books. 
So we hired a team and we basically went around the world and started going into libraries and basically grabbing physical books and scanning them and then loading them into a database. So they, were, they had to do that. Even if information isn't on the web, Google's trying to get it and put it on the web. And then videos where we bought, you, we purchased, uh, acquired YouTube, and we merged it in. And now, you know, we're, we're, making, uh, we're making videos higher definition and faster and more accessible for everyone all over the world. And so this many more videos are being added. And with Geo, this many more, this, uh, this many more uh, areas around the world are now, like, available for Google Maps with Street View and whatnot and then email flights and so on. So they can say like the steady progress they're making. And then with languages, it's quite cool to see they, you know, they Google started in English and then they started spanning out into different languages. And you know what progress looks like when it comes to languages because it's just the number of languages that your company or product like is in. So if you're just in English, that's just one. But if you're, if you are in English and Spanish and German and Mandarin, well, there's four, right? And so it's easy to measure progress. And it's quite cool to see every, every new letters to shareholders that comes out, they will report, you know, this year we, uh, this year we translated all of our services into like an extra 40 languages or something. And then they very quickly get up into the hundreds of languages. And I'm pretty sure right now, They've got like every single language there is Google works in, even some, uh, even some languages that are extremely rare, all right? And so that's progress there. And then mobile. So they wanted to be, they wanted Google to be accessible on mobile because a lot of people don't have computers. So Google actually acquired Android. Android wasn't Google's invention. They actually acquired that company and then, you know, started to... Uh, started to produce like Android phones and make those widely adopted. There is now more people on Earth that actually have a phone that runs on Android than than any other type of phone operating system. And then voice, right? And so very quickly you can see that like this this mission statement here, it really shows us how we're going to what we're trying to do and then the different components that we're trying to make progress on. And then if we look at useful, well, that would be, and I can write this down here. So useful is then trying to take all of this information that is organized and that is accessible, and then think of ways that humans would want to use all of this information to solve everyday problems, right? And so Google then works on different types of search algorithms. They then worked on like advertising. And what a lot of people don't understand is that Google is a master acquirer. A lot of people think they just invent everything, but you know, Google actually, Google actually acquired like images. And then they also acquired YouTube. They acquired Google Maps, Google Earth. They acquired uh, the algorithm for flights. They actually acquired Android. And they did more than this. They even acquired uh, DoubleClick, which is now called Google Ads. Google AdWords, they acquired that too. They're a master acquirer. They even acquired Google Docs, right? It wasn't called Google Docs back then, but they acquired that technology. And so... Because of this mission statement and because of how clear it is, they know exactly how to make advancements towards perfection and towards their goal. And so if we think of ways that all of this can be made useful, well, it's going to be uh, things like sharing. So if you think of Google Docs, you can share. You can also search. Like Google made videos searchable with YouTube. They made the web searchable with uh, Google Search. They made images searchable with Google Images. They made books searchable, not just by title, but by words inside the book with Google Books. And then they made maps and, you know, basically a satellite view of the world, like viewable with search again. 
And so you can kind of start to see what they do, right? They just, they have a very powerful mission that is very clear and defined. And then they break out that mission into different areas. They define a unit of measurement by which they can measure advancements. And they have a like measuring instrument by which they can measure advancements. And then they know where their baseline is, which is right now. They know where their goal is, which is like their perfection. And then they're just making steady, incremental advancements towards that goal, right? So at the start of this video, I showed you how you can basically get started in business by really defining, by really breaking it down to its first principles and looking at the fundamentals. So we've got a niche you're interested in. We've got their problem, the inverse of that problem, is the solution. Then you want to find people in that niche who have had that problem that now have the solution. They will exist. And then once you've found them, you want to see what they're doing differently from the people who don't have the solution and just live with the problem. Then you want to package that as a solution that you can sell as a product or a service or something like that to people in that niche with that problem. The byproduct of that will be value. Value means money and all of this is called a business, right? That is how you get started. That is how you get your first few clients. But once you've started to get a few clients, it becomes more about thinking big. It's like, you know, instead of just trying to solve, I'll tell you how I got started. I got started by basically looking at local service businesses. And I focused so tightly on a local service. It was like, I was helping plumbers. So I just chose, plumbers. I don't know why, I just, just chose them. And then I started talking to them about what their biggest problem was. And a lot of them said that they really wanted hot water cylinder repair clients. And I said, why? Why do you want those? And they said, well, because they're easy jobs and we make a lot of money and they're very urgent because, you know, if the hot water's out in the family home, people need to have showers and things. So people will often call and say, yes, I need it now. Come and do it now. And then they pay. There's no price shopping between people. There's no, you don't get like fickle people who are like, oh, maybe I'll think about it. It just happens. And I was like, okay, well, how are your current providers like helping you? Because they were using like agencies. Uh, at, at the time when I was speaking to a lot of these plumbers, they were using uh, the yellow pages to run Google AdWords for them to try and uh, get them clients. And they said, well, What's happening is Yellow Pages just tries to get us any clients anywhere, right? And they just run ads for anything related to plumbing. That could be a leaky tap. And then I said, okay, well, are there any areas that you would prefer to have clients in? And obviously they said yes. Obviously in the, uh, in the wealthier areas and also in the areas closer in proximity to their main base because that means less commute, less waste. And so we basically drew a ring fence around the main area where, where they would want clients. And then we basically started to target hot water cylinder repair clients in that local cluster. And I was just getting started, right? And I was going up against a pretty big competitor, which was a, like the people that were calling plumbers pretty much every single day was the Yellow Pages just trying to sell them AdWords. And so how do, how do I compete? some dude working out of his parents' garage in New Zealand, how do I compete with, with Yellow Pages? It's simple. You just look at a niche, find it, focus on something small, find out what their problem is by talking to them, and then provide a solution to that. So then I just went looking for plumbers who are very good at getting hot water cylinder repair clients. And the solution was pretty obvious. I mean, they, they were basically just running AdWords for hot water cylinder repairs, and the web page that you went to when you clicked on that was all about hot water cylinder repairs. And it was just all about hot water cylinders. They weren't really focusing on anything else. It was like the only thing this, this guy did. And I was like, okay, well, we need to do more of this if we want to get more of those clients. And honestly, like the, the, when I met with these uh, plumbers, and I used to meet with them in person back then, uh, we, didn't, we didn't do like strategy sessions and close over the phone like we were able to do later on. When I spoke to them and told them what I could help them with, and I told them that, you know, I knew that they'd probably prefer hot water cylinder repair clients, they looked at me like I was 
God or something. Because they were like, how, this is the first guy I've spoken to actually understands me and understands what I want. Why is everyone else I've been talking to just oblivious? And it was pretty funny to see because within a few months, I had basically gained competitive advantage over quite a big player and I'd started to acquire myself some clients. And then very quickly, I was able to get more clients, more clients, and before long, I had too many clients. And that is the power of breaking business down to its first principles and finding a problem and then solving it. And the thing is, is you can start small. Like I started back then focusing on plumbers who want hot water cylinder repair clients who are in Auckland, which is a tiny city within a tiny country called New Zealand, who are also willing and able to run AdWords. Like how small is that? But I was actually able to get a foothold in that market and get multiple clients paying me more than $2,000 per month each, right? So that you can start small. And that's the best way to get a foothold in business and get started. But then it becomes about thinking bigger. You want to think, once you've got some money and you're, you're out of survival mode, it's like, what is the big thing I'm aiming for? And I see a lot of businesses get stuck in these two places. The first one is they don't solve an actual problem and they don't focus on an actual niche. And what they're providing is something they believe to be the solution to an unknown problem, to an unknown niche, right? And this is just totally messed up, it's convoluted, it's never going to work. If it does work, it's gonna be a fluke and you're always gonna be like, you're always gonna be dealing with a lot of unknowns because you aren't really doing anything. And so it's critically important that you do like do solve a problem that really exists, not one that you just think they have, with an actual solution that actually solves the problem for a clearly defined group of people. That is the first problem I see most entrepreneurs make. They mess that up. Don't mess that up. The second problem I see entrepreneurs make is they get that first part right and they start making some money, but then what they do is they just kind of coast and they, they stagnate over time. And the thing is, is that if you're not moving forwards, you're moving backwards. And that means that you always need to be making advancements. And the only way to do that is to have a clear goal of where you're trying to go. And I'm guilty of making both of these mistakes. I made the first one by not solving the problem and it didn't work for me. Then I finally got it solved and then I stayed with that small thing for too long before thinking bigger and having a clear goal that I could make advancements towards. And so that's how I understand these things well because I made those mistakes. And you want to come up with this mission statement as early on in the game as possible. And I'll give you another example of this. But before I do that, I want to tell you what Google defines perfection as. And this is one of the easiest ways to think about the future of your company and the future of your product. So Google says, we're still a long way. They say this in, in the first or second uh, letters to shareholders. They say, you know, we're, we're making good progress, but we're still a long way away from having a perfect search engine, right? And then they say, well, what is a perfect search engine, you might ask? And they say, well, we've defined a perfect search engine as something that you can basically ask anything about, like you can ask any question about anything, you can basically ask it anything in the world you could possibly imagine, and it will give you the perfect, most accurate answer instantly and for free, right? That is what they've defined the like perfection as for Google. And what that basically is, is it's like some God level AI, right? It's like, it seems like a total fantasy and that, and like that would never happen, but that's good. That's what you want to do with your company because you want to start making progress towards that goal. And you're not trying to define your mission and your perfection goal as something that you, you're actually going to achieve quickly or easily. It's supposed to be pretty much impossible to achieve. And that makes people start making big leaps forward. And I'll tell you another example of this, which is one of my favorite ones. And it is Microsoft. So 
when Microsoft started, this is a long time ago, back when, uh, with Bill Gates, their mission statement was, a computer on every desk and in every home. Right? How clear is that? So what is Microsoft trying to do? They're just trying to get a computer on every desk and in every home. And what you've got to what you've got to understand is that Back then, when they set this mission statement, computers were the size of a house. Like, they, were, they needed cranes and trucks to move them. Not only that, but they cost upwards of $1 million. And not only that, but only scientists could actually use them because they didn't have user interfaces or keyboards or anything. You literally had to, like, feed tape into a machine and it would like tick around and then feed tape back out and you had to like decode all of the stuff. So like they weren't usable either. So if somebody wanted a computer, they would have to pay a million dollars, organize trucks and everything to deliver it to some like facility, like a factory. It probably had to be hooked up to like some type of industrial power. And then you would need an, a team of scientists and engineers to even know how to make it work. And not only that, but it has no actual purpose for the average person. Like, people didn't even know what they were supposed to use computers for when they first came out. And so you've got to understand that if Bill Gates says something like, I want to put a computer on every desk and in every home back then, that's that people would have looked at him and said, dude, you're out of your mind. You need to go check yourself into some kind of, like, psychiatric ward because there is no way in hell that you're going to put a computer in every home because computers are more valuable and larger than every home, right? So that's not going to happen. But Bill Gates could see the future and he knew what perfection would look like, right? And so let's look at this. If we're trying to put a computer on every desk and home, the key words here is like, you know, every is one of them. And then desk is another, home is another, and computer is the object. So what we can do is we can quickly start to break apart this one the same way we did to Google. So first of all, we're dealing with computers, right? Now, we need to put one on every. Every means every single person in the world, right? Then desk means that if it's going to go on a desk, then it's got to be pretty damn small. Because right now, computers are the size of a house. So how are we going to fit like a house on a desk? It's not going to work, right? So obviously, this dictates size. And home, that dictates that they're not just going to be used for like business and scientific use. They're going to be used for personal home use. And they're obviously going to have to be cheaper. They're going to have to be lighter. They're going to have to be able to be usable and they're going to have to be able to plug into 120 uh, volt power, right? So all of these things need to happen, which is actually pretty cool because it tells us exactly what we need to do. So obviously size, size of these things is going to be important. How do we know if we're making progress? Well, we're just getting these damn things smaller. We look at a computer, we break it out into its constituent parts, which is all of its components. We get a list of those components and we get a listing of their weight and their size, and then we basically partition that out to a bunch of different people, and we say, all right, your job is over the next six months and then every six months following to reduce the size of these assigned components by 50%, right? And so then they get to work, and then you know easily how to measure it because they come back every six months, they show you their parts, they should be smaller. And that's an easy way to start breaking this out into into what we need to do. So size, it needs to get smaller. Then cost. Because computers used to be a million dollars, we need to get them cheaper. We need to get them into a price range that people can afford, right? And more than that, we need some type of usability. 
because people are not going to be hiring a bunch of scientists to come into their home and use this thing. So from here, we know that it needs to get smaller. From here, we know that it needs to get cheaper. And here, we know that it needs to get like easier to use. And so from here came the inventions of the user interface, right? Like we can now see things like a desktop and drag files around, we've got an, a user interface. Before that, there was like punch cards and tape. And then after that, there was basically like DOS, where you had a black screen with code in it. And now you have a, like a user interface, a screen. And that totally changed everything. Now people can, can see it and use it. And also the mouse. And the keyboard. Right? These are all innovations based on this to achieve this. Right? The size thing. All innovations towards this to achieve this. And the price driving it down, all innovations towards this to achieve this, right? Also, we need some kind of practicality. And what I mean by this is, why would a human, let's say we get him small enough, let's say we get him cheap enough, and let's say we get him usable enough, but then still, why would a human want one on their desk and in every home? We need to start giving them a, a, like a purpose, a function to solve a problem. So Microsoft would have started looking at well, what do people do in their homes? And people like to write letters. They would type things up with a typewriter. You know, they need to type something and send it to people or mail it. So from here, we see the, uh, we see like word processor, like Microsoft Word. But then they notice that a lot of people also do budgets. And they also do their taxes. And so from here came Excel. And then they saw that people liked to do email and things. And so from here basically came these different products, which then became like Office. And this is a key piece here because without Office, without Microsoft Office, Microsoft's computers don't really have a purpose, especially in the beginning. I know they do now, but in the beginning. And so a lot of people don't actually know, but to achieve this mission, they had to do all of this, in, including the software. They had to drive down the price, they had to drive down the size, and they had to make them more usable and more practical. And by doing that, they were able to achieve this mission. And what's pretty cool is that while this would have sounded like a pipe dream, when Bill Gates first said it back in the day, it really came more than true. Because right now there's about 1.2 computers on every desk and in every home. It's a, The market's about 120% penetrated, right? It is fully achieved, more than achieved. So this is what's cool about defining perfection and like your mission statement. But you might think, well, if this is already done, how can we make it better? And this is why once you achieve a goal, you need to make it bigger again. And so what would perfection really look like for Microsoft? Well, I mean, size would basically have to make it invisible. And then cost would basically have to make it free. And then usability, you should just be able to th have a thought and then it just it, it does it. There is no interface. There is no keyboard, there is no input thing or output thing that you have to use, which are bandwidth constrained. It just, you have a thought and then bam, it just happens, right? So there is no size, there is no cost. Usability is at the speed of thought and practicality could be anything and everything, right? That would be perfection. And so you can see there's no end to this. And this is why this is such a great thing to think about in business is because you can really think big and it doesn't matter how good someone is at doing something, you can make it better. Like Google has not built the perfect search engine. Microsoft has not built the perfect like computer or perfect operating system. It's actually far from it. 
Now, while something is really good, and don't get me wrong, Google and Microsoft are extremely good companies. They're like some of the best in the world, right? But that doesn't mean it can't be better. And so I encourage you as an entrepreneur to think bigger and think in terms of perfection. Don't just try to think about how can I make something, how can I copy someone else and make it worse than them? I see people do this all the time. They see some company making some money doing something and they're like, well, if they're making about 100 grand a year, then if I make my product worse, then I should be able to get like half of that, right? This is totally stupid. Like, if you're going to do that, you may, if you're going to think and do something, you may as well do something big or do something worthwhile. Because if you build something worse than something else, then it's totally going to flop, right? You want to aim to be the best and you want to aim to invent things and solve problems that haven't been done yet. And I know that takes some balls and some courage and some resources. So that's why in the beginning you start small. You just find a niche you're interested in, you find a problem that's small but real, you solve it, you make, you make some money, you start building up your war chest and then you start to go big like this and think in terms of perfection. And so... You know, you might be thinking, well, what does consulting.com's mission look like and how do we see perfection, All right? It's a good question. And so for us, our mission is to educate every human on earth all right that is our mission now it's pretty big so but after watching this video you'll see why you want to make them big right it seems like oh dude that's so impossible that's stupid why would you try to do that it does seem impossible but to be honest I mean if you look back through history a lot of these things did seem impossible and I mean it doesn't even matter if you don't achieve it at least if you're aiming for something big, you're going to probably be further ahead than you would anyway. So it, it, there is no real downside to it, right? And so here, if we break it out, we've got educate and then every human on earth. So here we've got just earth that just basically means this needs to do ev like every human on this planet and educate, right? And so we're really thinking... And education can be in all sorts of different things, right? And then every human, that's all sorts of different languages. And that's basically, you know, that's, that's huge. It's unfathomable, really. Because how many different things might someone want to be educated in? And how many different people are there with all different needs and use cases and languages and environments? And not all of them are even hooked up to the internet yet. But... This is the cool part about it. Like, you've got to think big and then try to solve the problem. And this is what we're working through every day right now with my company, Consulting.com. And so, what does perfection really look like for us? And there's a good way that you can really figure this out. And so, I'm, I'm a big fan of customer surveys. And every year, we send out a survey to our customers and we ask them a bunch of questions and we typically incentivize the survey by giving away something like a laptop or something so that you know more people respond and they take the time to respond properly because they know there's something in it for them. And we do this and then we analyze all of the data and we really look at like what our customers don't like, what they really like, and we're basically looking at how can we do less of what doesn't work and more of what does work. And that's basically what we're doing. And then uh, we're basically, we, there's, another, there's a question in the survey, which is one of my favorites. And it goes like this. If you could wave a magic wand and have our product do anything for you, doesn't matter whether it's possible or not, what would it be? Right? This is a great question. I highly recommend that you survey your customers and somewhere in the survey have that question. And then the responses are awesome because... People really think, okay, doesn't matter if it's possible or not, what would I want? And we actually saw 
a common theme kind of start threading through and it was repeating and it was almost verbatim in its sentence structure and people were saying i wish you could just download all of this information and just put it on a chip and then put that chip in my brain and then i would just know everything and be able to do everything right and you might think well that's stupid at first because it's not possible right now but it's not a stupid response because we ask them, it doesn't matter whether it's possible or not. And we ask them this question so that we can really start to think about what would perfection look like. And so what people are really saying here is that, and I'll use red for this, they're saying that they want uh, like to learn. And within like learn, they want everything and at a master level. So you can learn things, there's different things you can learn, and there's different degrees to which you can learn them. So perfect would be, well, I would learn everything there is to learn, and I would be the best in the world at everything, right? That would be what perfection would be like. And then they want to do it in time they want it instantly they want it now one second and then effort with effort they basically want to do nothing and that's basically what perfection would look like for us is Basically, we have something, could be a chip that you could put in your brain or whatever, could be, could be anything. But whatever this thing does is you learn everything there is to know at the highest possible level, instantly, without any effort. Right? <laughs> Who wouldn't want that? If we had that, we would be, well, first of all, the world would, would probably change in more ways than it's ever changed before in the history of, of everything. But we would also be the most successful company in the world, right? So this is what's cool about thinking like this, is you want to think big, define the mission, and then break it out into its components. And then you want to interview and survey your customers to ask them what they, their wildest dreams would be. If they could wave a magic wand and have our product do anything that they want, what would it be? This together helps us define what perfection would look like, right? And once we know what perfection looks like, and once we know what our mission is and what our customers want, and along the axes on which improvement must be made, and also the unit of measurement and the measuring instrument that we can use to measure all of this, then it becomes a lot clearer about what we should be doing what projects we should be taking on, who we should be hiring, and like everything, right? And if you wanna know how to do really well in business, you don't start like a YouTube channel. You don't start like a Instagram page and start like taking photos of yourself with these different cars and things. And you don't just get really good at Facebook ads or really good at at copywriting or any of this crap you don't get really good at selling like really what you want to do is you just want to find a problem that's really big that no one's really solved solve it better than anyone else and continue to chase perfection and when you do this you don't really need to be good at doing anything else like sales doesn't even exist if you have one of these things right because it it doesn't need to be sold. Everyone would be running towards it. And you don't need to advertise it and market it heavily. It just spreads, right? And I think there's a huge problem in the world right now where a lot of businesses are just making copies of other businesses. And what's worse is they're just making worse copies or copies that are identical, right? At least if you're going to copy someone, just make it a little bit better, right? Because otherwise the world isn't any better off with you introducing your shitty thing. 
and you're not going to be any better off because your business is going to struggle and then you're going to have to resort to taking photos of yourself in front of different cars to try and sell your shitty thing, right? When you have to resort to shit like that, it's generally because your product sucks so bad there's no other way to sell it other than by kind of lying and misleading people, right? And so the world is pretty twisted with the entrepreneur market these days. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people who are still doing it like this and trying to do big things. But, like, if you're going to choose a path to go down, I would spend most of your time working on this stuff. If you spend an hour working on this and chasing perfection, or if you spend an hour working on marketing and sales and photos on your Instagram, like, this is how you're going to get big wins. This is how you're going to make real progress. And what's cool about this is, you know, we haven't even talked really about money here. Like, we're not talking about how to charge people, how to, like, bill them, how to, like, say, how to raise your tonality to try and, like, get someone to pay you money. None of this shit. Like, we're just looking at how can we actually solve a problem for people really well that they just will come to us and be like, money. And then we provide it to them, and they're happy that they gave us money. And then they go tell all their friends, right? That is what real business is all about. It's about this stuff. And so that's basically it for today's video. I just wanted to explain perfection and the two main mistakes I see businesses make. The first one is they don't solve a problem, they don't have a market, and they don't really have a solution. And the second one is is that when they do have that and they're making some money, they don't think big enough. They don't really start defining the mission, the vision, and chasing perfection. Now, if you liked this video, just click that like button. And also, uh, let me know what you thought in the comment section beneath this video. Also, subscribe to my channel, because I release a video like this once every week, along with customer interviews and uh, other resources like that. So that's it for today's video. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one soon. Also, next time you see me, I'm about to go get a haircut now, so this mullet is, this is the last you're going to see of it. So if you want to get a screenshot in all of its glory, that's your last chance because it's going to be coming off because it is taking me too much time to deal with it and it's unproductive. So thanks for watching this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one soon.